We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be delving a deep dive into Islamic literature, uh, manuscript traditions, a lot of stuff that's way over my head. I have no clue. But before we do, I want to mention something. Do you remember when I did my Mormonism series? If you didn't, you should check out the series. Because at the start, you're thinking, as a skeptic, you might go, well, that guy's a crook, and he's this, and he's that. But then from a believer standpoint, a Mormon will look and say, hey, this was the prophet. This man was a man of God. And so I feel like I'm caught in between both sides. Because by the time they got close to the death of Muhammad, not Muhammad, but to Joseph Smith, and I use Muhammad as the example, um, I didn't want to see him die. You start to fall in love with the character, whether you think he's good or bad. Either way, you start to fall in love with the story and what is painted about him. Well, I recently read Leslie Hazleton's work after the prophet about the Sunni Shia split as well as the first Muslim. And when I watched this in my head as I was listening to the audiobooks, I started to like gain better insight to the culture and the history and I can't imagine if you were to speak to this man, you'd either loved him or hate him. I can't imagine either sitting in the middle when it came to Muhammad. So my studies into Islam, I ask all skeptics out there to join me in putting aside the polemics against the apologist and trying to argue against those who are desiring to hold on to their faith and this is what they want and educate yourselves because there's so much more to learn than what this back and forth with people who believe. Uh, it's the same thing in Christianity. Like, I don't waste my time spending 24-7 arguing with Christian apologists. There's way more material out there to learn and fall in love with. And with that being said, sorry for the long intro. We have Dr. Haitham Sidki joining us today. Welcome to Myth Vision, my friend. Uh, happy to be here. I hope you don't mind my intro. I really feel like I got to talk to my side, my team, and let them know, like, there's so many wonderful things to learn about the history. Sure, there's ugly things. I can go to the Old Testament, find you all sorts of stuff, and you go, ooh, or the Hebrew Bible as if a Jew's watching, um, out of respect for them. But it's like, yeah, we can we can focus on that. And I do that sometimes. But what I really like is discovering things I've never known and how humans have developed these interesting traditions and especially the manuscript traditions, like what was going on in their heads, all of that fun stuff. And being an expert in this field, I figure I'd get the best. And I'm having you join us today. So thank you so much. No problem. Real quick, if you're interested in checking out some of his literature, go to his academia page. Be sure to go. I mean, he's got tons of stuff written on the topics. So if you're wanting to go and take a deep dive, you'll probably never come out of this rabbit hole. Please check that out. And also the upcoming website, I hope everybody gets the opportunity. It's ITSCA, or how do you pronounce it? Yeah, ITSCA, I-Q-S-A, International Quranic Studies Association. Awesome. So what's this website about? Yeah, so we've just launched a new website uh, uh, for ITSCA, the organization. And the idea is we are really creating a new platform that connects uh, the public. So everyone who is interested in everything to do with the Quran and Islam with the leading scholars of chronic studies around the world. Uh, what that means is we're offering like a new subscription platform. We give people access to blogs contributed by the uh, scholars at large uh, that are part of IXA. Uh, we have webinars that they can attend with the leading scholars and be able to interact with them and ask questions. And we have master classes and a lot more access to a ton of material that's launching on our website. So please go check it out at ixaweb.org. Awesome. Yeah, definitely check it out. I'm definitely going to go join it. I mean, if I'm going to learn this subject, <laughs> I need to access all of you scholars. So once again, I'm I'm greatly like appreciative of having you here. What are your credentials for those who may not know who you are on my channel? What makes you an expert in these in the studies? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first thing I'd say is time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when it comes to a lot of so I'm very interested in chronic manuscripts and reading traditions and. Uh, as far as I'm, other than one or two specific programs, there aren't that many, uh, um, you know, programs that specialize in Quranic manuscript studies. Uh, and as a result, you know, a lot of people who work in that area, uh, even, so, you know, some of the leading uh, scholars in the world um, have really just, you know, develop that expertise by spending a lot of time working with the material. Um, and, you know, for me, it's been, it's been basically a little bit over a decade. Uh, I also have, uh, you could say traditional uh, classical Muslim uh, training in the reading traditions. Uh, there's this thing called uh, Ijaza, which is like this uh, certification. Uh, and so I've, I've studied the reading traditions. I've studied some of the classical Muslim works on Quranic orthography and things like that. 
Uh, and you know, my 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 interest, of course, is and I I like to bring together my background. So my my MS uh, uh, it was in applied math, and my PhD was in uh, computational molecular engineering. And I like to bring together the computational side to help us learn new insights on what was going on with the transmission of the Quran, both the oral side and the written side uh, in the earliest period. Yeah, that that's what really got me uh, when I when I interviewed uh, Dr. Nasser. I was he started talking about orality, and I was like, okay, so like oral, like as in like what we kind of hear some scholars say that there's like an oral gospel that gets written into a text, something like it, but it's actually far more than that in Islam. The orality seems to be where the magic happens, where the 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 majestic takes place, and the text later on takes on it seems that kind of uh, majestic aspect that the the oral actually had so people start to take the text more serious and and um doesn't mean it wasn't taken serious it just means that the the real the pronunciation and the and the vocals so there's a lot to that and you know dr hylam i know that or dr sidki <laughs> i call you by your first name um when i look into this i wonder how much of that tradition does stem from earlier Judeo-Christian oral practices. It makes me wonder. I, there's a huge mystery on like pre-Islamic culture and what was going on and and where all this comes out of. So I'm as mesmerized as an ignorant uh, person on the topic as maybe you are, except you have far more questions, meaning you know a, a lot more. And the more you know, the more questions you have. So thank you so much for taking the time. Can we jump into questions if that's okay? Absolutely. Awesome. So question number one, could you explain what the seven Ahruf Hadith is? Yeah, so that's, I mean, <laughs> can I explain it? Uh, nobody really knows what it means, but I'll give, I'll give you a little bit of, of background and context. So, uh, you know, there's not one, there's not one uh, way to read the Quran, or I guess to put it a little bit differently, there is no one Quran, at least according to Sunni Islamic belief. Uh, there are different uh, renditions or different, you know, versions of the Quran, and the question is, where did all of these come from? So the tip, the 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 explanation or the justification for the the existence of all of these different versions of the Quran goes back to a hadith. So a hadith is basically a saying or uh, some report attribute or action or some report attributed uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, and. Um, the, 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 there are different th uh, reports that mention this concept of sabat ahruf. If we translate it literally, it would be seven letters. And we'll go into what that kind of, that may or may not mean. Now, uh, at a high level, this, uh, the, 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 the body of reports around this seven letters, sabat ahruf, all deal with some sort of a, a prophetic, uh, allowance or justification, uh, for the, or permission, I guess I should say, for the existence of different versions or different readings of the Quran. All right. Now, the most famous report to do with the Sabbat Ahruf, it goes something roughly like this, that there were two companions, one by the name of Umar, so the very famous caliph, the the the, uh, the second caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, and another man by the name of Hisham ibn Hakim ibn Hizam. So uh, what happened was, uh, this guy Hisham, he was praying and he was reciting some Quran and Omar happens to walk by and he hears him reading uh, uh, some Quran from a certain chapter called uh, Surah Al-Furqan and he's like, this doesn't sound like what I just learned. What the hell are you saying? And so he said like, I, I, like, oh, I wanted to grab this guy but I waited for him to finish his prayer. So once he finished, I grabbed him and I dragged him to the Prophet. And I, 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 I complained, I said, hey, you know, what the heck is this man reading? You know, this isn't the Quran that you taught me. And so essentially what happens is the prophet tells the man to read and the man reads and then he tells Omar to read and then Omar reads. And then he says, uh, you know, after each one reads, he says, unzilat. it's like, like this, it has been sent down. Uh, and so he basically approves both of them. And then he, he kind of ends it by saying, uh, unzil al -Quran ala sabat ahruf. the Quran was sent down upon Sabat Ahruf, this enigmatic phrase. Now, there are a couple other reports. Um, there are questions of like whether they're independent or not, uh, things like that. But really, this phrase has perplexed Muslims for up until today. Nobody really knows what it like. What does it mean, Sabat Ahruf, right? Uh, but at least in Sunni Islam, it's understood to be the license or permission, the authority 
the prophetic authority behind the existence of multiple variants of the Quran. So in a nutshell, that is what the Sabat Ahruf tradition is. It's interesting, uh, and I'm just going into a couple of the bullet points, because this stuff's way over my head on a typical understanding. Uh, you sometimes hear the opinion expressed that the seven Ahruf and I'm going to say a roof, you know, <laughs> almost what a roof, roof, uh, uh, refer to dialects. Does that interpretation make any sense? Does it have to do with the dialect? Yeah. So very good question. Um, now I guess what I can do is I can give you a little bit of like reception history of how did Muslims attempt to explain it? I guess before that I should mention one thing. So one question that always pops up into people's minds is like, was the Sabbath Ahruf report invented in order to explain the existence of variation in the Quran, right? So that's, I think that's a very natural question to ask. So in, in, in you know, Western Hadith critical scholarship, we have different techniques we can use to try to date traditions. And nobody has actually done an exhaustive, uh, and I mean exhaustive, uh, uh, study of every single report associated with this Sabbath Ahruf concept. Uh, but at the very least, I mean, you can say like a, prelim a preliminary result uh, that I think will probably bear out once someone actually does the legwork is that this report was circulating very early. So it's like a first century report. So perhaps it is historic, like perhaps it is historical. And one other thing that speaks to that is the fact that if someone is going to make something up to explain variation in the Quran, why would they make something up that nobody can make sense of? Right. The very fact that people can't even agree on what the meaning of that is might speak to its, its, uh, uh, its historicity and its age. But to get back to your question, so people have tried to explain this in different ways, and people have given, I'll just give you a small window into the general categories of explanations. Now, one thing I do want to mention as well is like, if you go to much later works like Suyuti and things like that, they'll be like, you know, here are 40 different possible explanations of what the Sabbath Ahruf are. And, you know, the majority of those are, of, of those are a distinction without a difference. Like it could be this or this, or it was like a thing that later scholars like, like to show how erudite they were and how well read they were by showing all the possible, you know, variations of things that they can collect. You know, it's, it's kind of like flexing. Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, some of the earliest opinions about or explanations of what the Sabbat Ahruf uh, uh, are is like that they, they're like synonyms. So the example, uh, to give you in, in English, the best way I can translate it, and this is almost quite literally the statement we have from very early figures like a Zuhri and uh, Sayyid and then Musayyib and others like that. It's like, it's like me telling you, come here, get over here, advance, you know, like, like that sort of, it's, yeah. it's like, it's, it's synonymous phrases. Right. So there are statements like that, that are, that are transmitted from early authorities. Then we have people who, so, so that's sort of like the earliest layer, right? And then what you find is you find people who try to put together more holistic theories, right? Other than uh, than just like simple statements. And one of the earliest people is is a, a, a guy by the name of uh, Abu Ubaid al Qasim ibn Salam. So he dies uh, 224 AH, so the Hijri calendar. So he's basically like a, a um, an early third century figure, and he proposes this idea that the Sabbat Ahruf are lughat. They are uh, either dialects or linguistic practices, but maybe dialect, again, simplification, uh, let's say seven dialects. So he proposes this idea that these seven Ahruf are seven dialects, right? And that, and he names some tribes, like this is, this is, you know, this one might be the Hudayl, et cetera, and whatnot. And so he, he does that. Now, uh, implicit in that, by the way, so there is an important piece, which has to do with seven. So implicit in his explanation is understanding seven literally. Right. Mm. So there is a question. Is seven here intended to be literal or figurative? So we would call the figurative a takthir. So just like it's a bunch. Right. It's like me talking to, to you and saying, you know, man, I, I, I went to the uh, to the store to 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 buy some groceries and I was standing in line and there were uh, there were a dozen people in front of me. Right. Yeah. Do I literally mean there were 12 people in front of me or do I mean there were just a bunch of people in front of me? Right. Mm. Uh, and then we have we have different. Uh, uh, numbers that we use to denote different quantities of things. So when I say a dozen, I definitely don't mean a hundred. I mean like, like a, a small bunch. But when I say like, man, there were a million people, that gives you a different order of magnitude, right? So, right. so this is a question, and it really isn't. Some people are like very adamant about it. No, it absolutely is literal. Here's a refutation for anyone who ever says it's figurative. But it actually, 
uh, without kind of wandering into the weeds, it actually isn't that clear. And the reason is seven is a symbolic number. It's found all across late antique and prior to that, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, seven heavens, all that kind of stuff, right? So, so uh, Abu Ubaid uh, interpreted Seba here to be literal seven, right? Uh, and so he says, that, let, let's say sort of like the TLDR, he says there are seven dialects. Now, shortly after him, uh, uh, another man by, uh, named uh, Ibn Qutayba, he's a scholar, he comes along and he actually, he rejects this opinion. Uh, and he says, in fact, the Sabat Ahruf are seven categories of types of variation. What does that mean? That means like you have one category are uh, variations in case, like let's say grammar. What, another category are variations in dotting. Another category are variations in this. Uh, and he constructs his own like seven categories. Now, I think one thing that's pretty clear to people is that, you know, that's pretty arbitrary. You know, I can make a certain, I can classify variants into seven categories, but someone else can come along and classify them in seven different categories. And that's kind of what Ibn al-Jazari, another much later scholar does, is he he comes up with his own set, the classification of seven. And if someone can come up with seven, another person can come up with eight, another person can come up with six, etc. So that's another, but it is a very popular opinion that it represents seven different classes of, of variation. Uh, yet another opinion, and this one's also found kind of early, uh, is that the Sabbat Ahruf are seven different genres that are present in the Quran. Like you have, you have like punishment stories, you have law, you have things like that, right? And then other people uh, explain the Sabbat Ahruf as like esoteric um, uh, readings of the text versus the apparent readings and things like that. But the point is, not to go on forever, is that really there's no consensus as to what the Sabbat Ahruf really means. But and so, you know, do I personally think it has anything? To, it, it's the seven dialects. No. And I think people who uh, also oppose that opinion point out that that report that I mentioned to you about Umar and Hisham, they're both actually from the same tribe. They're both from Quraysh. And mm -hmm. if it was a dialectical difference, then, you know, you know, they're both from the same tribe. It doesn't make sense. Then other people, they come back and they say, well, maybe the other guy, yes, he was also from Quraysh, but maybe the person who taught him was not from Quraysh. And, and you can see how this can go on and on and on for a, uh, for a very long time. Yeah, it's always it's kind of not solidified, but it is an interesting question uh, with an interesting history behind how people kind of theologize all of this stuff, which you're not a theologian. I might as well say up front doesn't mean you don't know theology, but you're more into a historical critical approach rather than uh, trying to make interpretations. Um, so another question we have is you've recently published an article on regionality of the Quranic codices. Could you explain what you mean by regionality and tell us about some of your findings? Yeah, absolutely. So this was, I guess the product of about, you know, I don't know, three years of work on this, on this question. So uh, I guess, to, so there are two, two pieces to it. So the first thing is I'll give you some background. Um, uh, if you go and look in the traditional uh, uh, Muslim literature, they all, not generally speaking, I think unanimously uh, speak of a, a major event that took place during the reign of the third Caliph Uthman. Okay. And that major event is the codification of the Quran. So as the story goes, uh, prior to this codification, as we mentioned, there were different versions of the Quran. They are generally like the way the Muslim tradition conceived of these versions are as companion codices. So different companions of the Prophet Muhammad had different codices. And these codices had a, uh, let's say, a large is always, is always uh, uh, relative, but they had a certain degree of variation between them that was sufficient enough to cause uh, uh, let's say, um, argumentation between people. No, my version is the right one. No, my version is the right one, that kind of thing. Mm. And uh, apparently this broke out on the battlefield. Uh, uh, things got really heated and word got to Uthman and he said, you know what? Uh, we should standardize the text. So he uh, took on this project. He uh, elicited the help of Zayd ibn Thabit, who was another uh, companion, much younger, who was also a scribe of the prophet uh, Muhammad. And uh, uh, they basically made uh, a master copy, made copies of, of that copy, and then they sent them out to the different garrison cities across the Muslim empire. So that's the, the general story. And the question is, I know I think one interesting question is like, did that really happen? Right. Uh, uh, and and it, it, it appears that it did happen. And, and so how do we know that? Well, you know, well, one thing we can we can find out is, you know, by, by looking at the different manuscripts that we have that have survived of the Quran, apart from one manuscript, which is the palimpsest, um, they're extraordinarily close to each other. Like they're very, very, very similar to the point where 
I mean, nobody can would look at them and be like, these are all like these, these are completely independent, you know, and this isn't a case of like the difference between, you know, the the gospels, right? That's these are, like <laughs> differences at the level of like spelling of words and things like that. I hate to say it, but this is what really bothered me about Christian apologists who love to come after Muslims. It's like, um, I don't think you realize how like your manuscript tradition is not good compared. If you're going to be like, if you're comparing them, it's apples to oranges. I mean, it seems that Islam had a far better, uh, uh, they held on to the tradition and the manuscript tradition. I'm willing, I mean, I've actually said this as a skeptic, like I'm totally okay if this all went right back to the prophet. It doesn't matter to me. Like I don't get why, maybe they're feeling self, like there's some type of self-conscious, like, ah, oh, we got to attack them where it hurts us the most. I don't know. It makes no sense to me. Like they have a very good, strong tradition out of all of your academic, the academics such as yourself have come on. It's convinced me that this stuff goes pretty much back. And I don't rely on conspiracy theories in order to like bolster a position. Well, they burned a bunch of stuff. Uh, like, you know, like that's somehow proof to them that this is, it's like that scene from uh, Dumb and Dumber where Jim Carrey is like, so you're telling me there's a chance, you know, like, <laughs> like, no. So sorry for interrupting. I just, Oh no, that's explain. fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, uh, uh, you, you did touch on something very interesting. Um, so let me just kind of finish this piece. So is there, uh, um, uh, well, let me comment on it because I will forget. So this question of like, was there like a Quran burning that took place and whatnot and things like that. So it does. So burning is, is a trope, right? So, so whether or not things were burnt, like, we can't know, but definitely, but definitely is also a strong word, but it does seem like other traditions, other textual traditions. So what I want to do is I want to bring this back to sort of a uh, more um, like clinical approach to think about text types and things like that, because that's how I approach, I approach studying manuscripts. And I think it is helpful to think about that uh, just to, to have like an, a framework in which everyone can kind of speak a common language without coming in with different presuppositions. So uh, what I want to say is we don't really have uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 it does really seem like other uh, textual traditions were stamped out in whatever method, whether it was, you know, uh, things were burnt or buried or reused, recycled, because we have a palimpsest, that mm -hmm. also, you know, that could have happened. Now, one interesting thing, so, so one common thing that comes up, well, if Uthman ordered all these other Qurans to be burnt, or let's just say destroyed or eliminated, what was on there? Like, is this like, is there a big scandal? Was there like all this super weird, different material. Right. And the undertext of the Sana'a palimpsest, so uh, just to give readers an idea of what a palimpsest is, so so people used to write on parchment, so parchment is basically treated uh, animal skin, and uh, you know it's very expensive to produce. And not only that, when you write on it, it isn't paper and you can't really erase, but what you can do is you can scrape things off and you can scrub. And the, the actual parchment is, I guess, durable enough to withhold that, uh, to, to withstand that. So you can, you can scrape off the old writing and then you can basically wash it and, you know, sand it down, if you will, uh, and then give it a fresh coat and then write on it a second time. Uh, and what happens is over, uh, over, so m my guess is, is, but most likely when the, when the palm test was reused, the, the, the person who wrote on it fresh could not see what was on there before. It would look pretty clean. But there are like sort of sm traces of the metals in the uh, ink that was used that oxidized over time. And it brought out, it sort of, you know, it's like sometimes like you write with like lemon ink, you know, when you were a kid and it's invisible, you take a heater to it and, and it kind of comes out. But it's the same idea. It reappeared over centuries. Uh, and then what we can do is we can augment what is visible to the naked eye with you know, multispectral imaging and, and XRF imaging and things like that to bring it out even more and we can read it. And so we've done that. It's not we, I, I haven't done that. I mean, but, uh, uh, you know, Bahnam Sadegi, Mohsen Godarzi, Asmahid Ali, uh, Elizabeth Poon and others have basically have different attempts at deciphering the undertext. Now, uh, what we can say is the undertext is very, very, very close to the Earthmanic text. Right. So we want to use now it differs in a few words here and there, paraphrasing, slightly different things like that. But there, there are no as f we haven't deciphered all of it. There are still some folios that haven't been deciphered. But what we have deciphered, which is a pretty sizable chunk, there is not a single verse that's out of place. There's like one, but it's very clear it was a scribal error, or at least that's a. I think it's a very compelling hypothesis, like one tiny verse that is completely inconsequential. But everything is there. So if someone wants to base something on material evidence. 
Well, with, I don't really care if someone comes to me and says, look, here is a tr- here is a report from the Muslim tradition yeah. that says that there used to be a surah that was like this long and that was lost and now it's this short and all that kind of stuff where like there were all these things. Like, maybe that was the case. But as far as we can tell so far, the other textual traditions that were eliminated prior to the Uthmanic codification are marginally different but not substantially different from the Uthmanic text, from the Uthmanic tradition. So on the basis of material evidence, my, I would say, and there are reports like that in the Muslim tradition that say like, oh, this chapter Al-Ahzab, you know, I think it's 36 or 33, I don't remember now, used to be as long as Q2, which is like the longest surah or Q9 or whatever. And to me, like, I don't, that is not meaningful to me unless uh, uh, unless I see some some material evidence. So as far as I uh, uh, I look at it, the other traditions were marginally different than the Uthmanic tradition, but not substantially so. So that's how I look at it. It's almost like um, when I spoke to Dr. Nasser, and I mean, like, I'm barely learning, but I, I feel like I'm picking up, you know, what you guys are putting down. Uh, but the idea that, like, they found the Quran on, on leaves and on flat stones and things like this, one could believe that to be the case. And then one could say, well, I think this is mostly tradition. Um, there are certain things, for example, the people who are, are – antagonist uh will love to find the bad and dwell on it and then ignore when other claims that are also oral tradition or statements uh, without any empirical data if it looks bad they like to jump on it if it looks good they'll 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 try to downplay it or something and for me the reason why i said that i wouldn't care if this came all the way back to the prophet to me it's not textual how 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 well is it preserved that's not like for me that's not a hill that like I love it's interesting. I love learning it. The point I'm making is it's not like whether this went back to the prophet or not, this somehow proves me right or wrong or something like that for their that seems to be their motives. Does that does that make sense? Whereas what I'm interested in is just let me just learn the history. I don't care about right and wrong. It's more about like what happened and what can we know about these things. I want to try and shift our focus from trying to debunk people or try to be disproving of stuff. That's ultimately what I'm trying to do and just to educate people. Uh, I, I do find that really interesting. This whole, this whole idea of where in regionality the codices and things like that. What what are the nature of those regional variants? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, absolutely. So just to, I guess now we can circle back to that. I apologize for going on that tangent. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, so essentially, um, what we can do is, you know, the 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 the, the it turns out that the codices, the, the copies of the codices that were made during this Uthmanic project were not identical. There were small differences between them, and uh, they're they're preserved in in books uh, of Quranic orthography, which what we call rasm and things like that. And they mention, you know, the re- the different uh, regional codices had, you know, some had this variant and others had that variant. And there's about you know forty odd differences between them. Uh, and the question is like. How how much does that reflect reality? Um, and uh, what so what Noldica showed a long time ago is that uh, it turns out that if you if you look at all these variants, they actually form what's called a stemma, like a, a genealogical tree, right? Very beautifully, it, it forms a stemma, which indicates that well, you know, this is a copying process. This was copied from here, and you know, there were scribal errors that were introduced that basically are responsible for the differences. Right. And then, and then uh, in about 2004, Michael Cook came along and he refined Noldica's hypothesis a little bit, and he narrowed it down to four potential different uh, uh, patterns of copying. Like, so uh, I guess implicit in what I'm saying is that there are four codices. So one was kept in Medina, uh, which uh, which was the the capital at the time. One was sent to Basra, one was sent to Kufa, and one was sent to Syria. Uh, and I would argue it was sent to Hems in, in Syria. And uh, essentially. Uh, what what I do is I say, well, you know, that was done on the basis of the literary reports, but how does that reflect reality in the manuscripts? So I basically go scouring all the manuscripts I have access to, and I collect <laughs> all the data uh, that I that I can, uh, and I, I I apply basically uh, what we'd call phylogenetic analysis. Uh, so it's the same kind of thing that we use to study uh, evolution and speciation. We can use very similar techniques uh, to generate uh, stemmas uh, or these these family trees. And I show that yeah, all these manuscripts go back to four ancestral codices. So wow. uh, it is it is consistent with that. And then based on radiocarbon dating of some of the manuscripts that we use that I used to generate that tree, we can basically say yeah, the the time window is consistent with around 650, the reign of of the third caliph with men. Now, 
There's one more piece I want to add. So how, what is the, okay, well, that's great and all. Well, what else can we learn? So one interesting thing I, I try to argue is that awareness of these variants the, between the, the, the different uh, regional codices was learned over time. So it wasn't like each codex was sent with a list, you know, like an announcement, like, hey, guys, here are all the differences between your codex and all the other ones. They were just sent. And as people just travel and, and information diffused throughout the empire, people started comparing or maybe, you know, you'd read in prayer and I'd listen to you back. Like, oh, you know, mine's a little different. And then I'd be aware and then be like, you know what, let me go through systematically and try to pick all these out. And so what I show is this is what I argue is that essentially knowledge and awareness of the regional variants emerged over time. It wasn't there like or, so from time t equals zero. And the way I show that, uh, there are a couple approaches, but one thing we can do is we can compare the reports to the oldest manuscripts we have. And one thing is that orthography, so spelling evolves over time, right? And mm -hmm. so the way things were spelled in the oldest manuscripts are a little different than the way things are spelled in later manuscripts. And what we find is when they mention, oh, look, there's a variant here and there, or there's this or that, the spellings that they are aware of are the spellings that are found in, let's say, like late first century, second century manuscripts, not the yeah. earliest ones. And we can use that to be like, aha. So this awareness of the regional variants approximately emerges around that time. And Just then- so everybody knows, 600, 700s AD, first, second century, you know, just so they know. Uh, they I'll, might think I'll, I'll try to give both, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> both, both dates. Uh, sometimes you get very uh, focused working in one area. And yeah, so, yeah. so my, I would say around, you know, Maybe late late seventh century AD, so like six ninety, somewhere around around there, roughly speaking, is when people started becoming maybe six eighty, something like that. People started becoming aware of the uh, uh, so within a couple of decades, uh, people started becoming aware of these uh, these regional differences, and then you start seeing manuscripts that are written with mixed variants. So someone might be like, you know, I really like the reading, you know, I really like the one in the Syrian tradition, so they, they'll use that in their manuscript and so on and that kind of thing. Uh, now, of course, you know the the so the, the, there's always been this question of like, you know, why did the Uthmanic Committee introduce these variants in the manuscripts? And so, you know, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I think the, a very natural way of looking at them is like, well, they were just minor scribal errors that were introduced when the things were copied. Uh, now, in the Muslim tradition, what you often find is you find um, this idea that, well, they were inserted on purpose. So these variants were added uh, purposefully uh, it, because... Otherwise, how would you accommodate multiple readings? So if I wanted to uh, uh, have, you know, two different readings, I mean, I could put the word in the margin, I could put it sort of interlinearly or something, but that's just messy. Well, what mm -hmm. can I do? Well, I can say, you know what, when you write one codex, put this one here and the other codex, put the other one there. Uh, and so that's the general, uh, um, or that is one of the explanations that are given. So that's the general nature of the uh, uh, of the regional codices and the variants. Uh, and, you know, one final, uh, I think, really interesting thing we can, we can learn about it, it, we can learn about, you know, through my study of the regional variants, is we can learn about how the oral and the written interact with each other. So uh, yes, you know, the manuscript tradition was copied, uh, th you know, the manuscripts were copied through written transmission, but the oral did also influence the written tradition and vice versa. There's so much in this that I won't be able to uh, unpack. There's so many amazing things you brought up that make me wonder, especially with the rise of an empire, uh, because this is not just taking place as like, the Koresh tribe and here we are and they're just in this little local area and this is it. No, like there's Medina and there's Mecca and then they're, they're, they're conquering Syria and here they are, you know, uh, uh, going to Persia. I mean, like at, by this time, I mean, they've already conquered Heraculus. They're they're This is like long, they're, they're expanding this empire. So you got to imagine how much they're trying to control all sorts of different people that are now starting to find their way in. Cause from what I understand, if I'm not mistaken, a historical approach after listening to a few of these books and, and kind of reading a little bit at first that it didn't seem like they were trying to kind of proselytize. It seemed like it wasn't a goal of Muhammad to like, like convert people, I think. And I don't know, I'm looking at it historically here. I'd love to get your histor historical opinion on this, but it doesn't seem like that was the mission. That's something that kind of took place as the empire rose, as more people became uh, conquered and and started to become part of the empire, is that they started to say, become Muslim. Now, 
is that historically accurate? From yeah, what so that's actually a very contentious question, even in the field. So, oh wow, was was Islam from its uh, inception, uh, uh, or at least from the establishment of the Medinan state, was it imperialistic? Was that part of the long term vision, or was it not? Uh, mm -hmm. So, depending on who you ask, was the Islamic project the as an empire was it ethnic? Was it religious? Was it so you have the people? Uh, uh, um, you know, sharing or, you know, was it universalist? Was it exclusivist? Was it this? And this is very contentious. And I am not uh, a historian of early Islam, and that's very specialized. So there are different opinions out there actually in the field right now, and there are different books that scholars wrote, try to argue these different positions. And so <laughs> I am noncommittal on this. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe time will tell. So yeah, I kind of wondered. And the only reason I brought it up, and, and I'm very thankful for your honesty on not knowing. Uh, I, I that's how you know someone's an academic when they say, "Well, I'm not sure." Uh, that makes me feel very comfortable. I just say that for those who are watching to keep in mind. Whenever you're interviewing academics, you'll you'll notice that when they don't know, that's a good sign. Uh, if they or they're not certain, they might have an opinion, but they'll usually like refer their opinion and keep it off record just because they don't want to put that on record if they're not experts in the field. Uh, I ask that because. With the rise of the empire and having manuscript tradition out there, I wonder if that the different cultures played a role in the impact in some sense. Uh, like just an analogy, and then I'd love to let you do whatever, you know, say whatever. Early Christianity, most of the scholars I talk to think it was Jewish from the start, purely Jewish, like, like no Gentiles were involved. In fact, there are elements in Matthew's gospel where Jesus's own words are saying, don't even go to them. Actually, uh, do not go to the Samaritans. Do not go to the Gentiles. Rather go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which sounds to be Jews. And then after he dies, and then, of course, the end of Matthew says, oh, now go into all the nations and proselytize and whatnot. Did Jesus really have that mission in mind, or is that something that the followers had? And it, the Gentile influence on Christianity makes me start to think elements have creeped their way into the movement that have kind of developed to this expansion idea. That's the only reason I brought it up. So, yeah. And so, uh, so I, I do see the Uthmanic codification as a political project. And I think, I mean, I think it was a brilliant move, you know, I, I, I politically speaking, I think it was a brilliant move and uh, uh, there are really, so this is just a small point I'll make. There are interesting questions around why the Quran is in the form of a codex. So it could have been a scroll, I mean, you know, it could have been a scroll, right? It could have been, so why is it a codex? And the specific structure of the codex, the specific uh, like codicological aspects, the layout of the codex, how surahs, how chapters are separated, things like that. Um, it, it, more work needs to be done on, on sort of contextualizing that tradition in, in and understanding it, its development and its emergence uh, in in late antiquity, and I think we can learn a lot about about the influence and about the interaction between uh, 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 cultures uh, that led to the Muslim state adopting the Codex as the specific form for their religious scripture. Uh, wow. So that's that's like an unanswered question uh, as of yet, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, I love it though. It's this is fun. Um, so I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, and and it's just because I'm totally Western, and I, I'm trying to learn how to say some of these things but the uh next question is what is the qira am i saying that right uh it's qira uh, qira uh, qira reading qira. tradition of the quran what is it like what is a what is a qira reading yeah. tradition of the quran yes so a qira or a re i just refer to it as a reading tradition from from this point on so a, a reading tradition is essentially a uh, uh, systematic way of rendering the written text of the Quran into speech, right? So, uh, uh, you know, Arabic um, is not like, uh, I guess even English, but but basically the, the earliest manuscripts, the earliest codices, uh, and this is just, a, 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 this is just by virtue of the fact that they were written in Arabic, not everything is expressed in it. What does that mean? That means that uh, uh, you know, there's no vocalization, there are no vowels, there are no case endings, there are no, none of these kinds of things. And even sometimes you don't get consonantal dotting and whatnot. And so in order to, to the, the written is not sufficient, like to con contain, uh, all of the information needed to 
turn it into words, right? right. Uh, so a reading tradition is essentially the uh, 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 rendering the written into the into the spoken. So uh, that's abstract. And what does that actually mean? What that means is that the Uthmanic codex, the Uthmanic text, uh, there are different ways of rendering that into speech. One very common example is in the first surah, you know, Q1, you have Malik Yomidin, so the, the, uh, the king uh, of, of the day of judgment, or Malik, the owner uh, of the day of judgment. Uh, and those two are different readings. A reading tradition is every is every decision that you make on how you want to vocalize a word. All of that, all of, in, in in all of their permutations, represent a uh, system, a reading tradition. So if I take a reading tradition and I like switch one word to something else, that's a different reading tradition. It's simple. I am simplifying it. There are differences among transmitters, but that's just the general idea is that right. uh, a reading tradition is, is a, a fixed systematic uh, rendering of the written text into, into uh, oral. And reading traditions are typically ascribed to readers. So different people had different reading traditions, right? Uh, and those reading traditions can vary uh, a little bit or they can vary a lot. But one thing they have in common, at least the uh, canonical ones, which I'll talk about in a, a moment, is that they all more or less follow the Uthmanic Rasm, the Uthmanic uh, 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 text very closely. Hmm. So um, the general uh, um, idea uh, is that even though the text, the written text of the Quran was codified during the reign of Uthman, people still read it differently. Right. So they had different they vocalized it differently. And anybody can just voc could vocalize a text differently, whether it's through choosing different combos or coming up with new combos or what have you. There were just many different reading traditions and uh, those different reading traditions proliferated because imagine permutations. Every time I permute something, that's technically a new one. Then you can get all kinds of like an infinite number of possibilities. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then. Basically, in the fourth century, there's a, 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 a guy by the name of Ibn Mujahid, and he comes along and he decides to, to limit, restrict the number of, to canonize, I guess you could think of, right. reading traditions to seven. Uh, so he picks, he picks the readings of seven individuals, um, and he pu publishes them in his book, uh, publishes, you know, he writes a book yeah. uh, uh, called, you know, uh, Kitab al What was the publishing company's name? No, I'm just yeah, right. <laughs> The, 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 the book of the seven uh, readers, and that catches on more or less. Um, now, one important thing to keep in mind, so, and, and then, and then like about, you know, I don't know, 700 years later, uh, Ibn al-Jazari comes along and he adds three, if you will, to the canon. And now we have today, there are 10 canonical reading traditions. But one thing to, to one important point to make is, it's not like the other one, it's not like a guy came along, you know, 700 years after the fact and said, I'm just going to add these three additional reading traditions to it. They were actually transmitted in the same way the other seven were transmitted the whole time. It just wasn't considered part of the canon. I don't know the way, the best example to give. I don't know enough about the history of, of, of you know, the New Testament and whatnot, but it's it's like a, there's a non-canonical gospel that's being used by communities and copied and whatnot. And then maybe like, at, you know, in the year 700, they decide, you know what, we're going to add one more gospel to the canon. It's not like the gospel appeared magically out of nowhere in the 7th century. Right. It just wasn't part of the New Testament officially until they decided to add it. That's maybe the analogy I would give yeah. in terms of, because I have heard some different uh, uh, sort of misconceptions about where the, the remaining three come from. Uh, but, yeah, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, th that makes sense. And, and there are certain schools or certain um, Christian denomination if i could use the term or the particulars like catholics do have more books in their canon even though the writings they don't consider them canonical they have the books attached to their literature uh some are pseudepigraphical writings or whatever but then they still see them as um holy literature they just don't consider them canonical so they're not on the same wow. level but they're there that's kind of the example i guess could be there i do think it's interesting in that question, because I was going to follow up with um, who determined what are now the canonical readings, which you answered, and why did they choose those readings? But I guess a fair way to say it, it today, are there Muslims that, that read outside of those 10 canonicals? No. So it's sort of the, the one, one very important aspect of, of consider some, considering something acceptable for reading uh, is the is is sort of maintaining an oral tradition, 
um, uh, 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 like this sort of um, a living tradition of those readings. There are four more uh, uh, that they generate that some people yeah, that are more or less kind of still not non canonical, but not 100% canonical that are still transmitted. But generally speaking, outside of the 10, um, people do not read according to those traditions anymore. Uh, it's just, they just, they just stick to the 10. They're still in works. They're still in books. They're documented. They're there, but they're just not like recited as part of the performance. So they're not prayed with. They're not used uh, in a religious or liturgical sense. Do they're you documented think, in the books. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's all. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you think that um, the same way in the 400s, and I say 400s, meaning around a year 1000 or so, uh, you know, for those who are watching, who aren't familiar with the dating in Islam. Um, do you think that there's the, the chance that Islam might adopt those four as canonical at some point? I, I, I ask just because sometimes we get stagnant and like we've, we've, can, can, you know, made it, things canon and like, we just won't change. This is the way things are. And do you think that um, that doesn't seem to be something that will happen? I don't know if I can answer that. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, this is an opinion thing. There's no way to like... I mean, it depends. So the question is, well, the, the problem is, you know, at least a couple of the of the four, they don't, they don't follow the, the ortho, they don't follow the Uthmanic custom 100%. And that's one of the conditions that Muslims have kind of uh, established as a condition for a valid uh, reading. You know, they have this idea, it's called like Sunnah Mutaba. It's like a, 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 a an a communal practice that's been established. And the idea goes like this, is like, look, the earlier generations, they decided to all come together and agree, we're only going to read according to readings that follow the Uthmanic text. And since they established that, there's no reason for us to go back and, you know, carve a new path, if that makes sense. Will it happen in the future? I have, I have no idea. So, okay, before we get to who these readers were and, and, and things like that, just one more question. Uh, this, this gets into the whole, like, I always refer back to what I know about biblical studies, and there's probably some unique things that Islamic studies has that maybe I can't analogize. But the way I understand this is just because someone came up on the 400s and had this standardized, let's get the 10 canonical readings, these are them, there was a common, like, they probably were the most popular, well-read ones already so like where people like i'll give you an example people go oh the canon didn't exist uh till the fourth century when constantine and they had the council and all this and then people are like actually no uh, a couple hundred years before that there were already church fathers that were using certain text and they just kind of solidified that canonization over time is that would that be a good analogy to say what's happening here i think that's an excellent analogy that's a very very uh, uh good observation so um, by and large, nobody knows specifically why Ibn Mujahid so chose those seven. In fact, some people after him criticized him, you know, like, why did you pick that guy? You should have picked this other guy who's more deserving of being in your book. But over time, you know, it's, it, it crystallized and it more or less got, got accepted. So the question now is, I think one interesting question is, well, what, if we go back to manuscripts prior to the canonization, what do we see? Do we see the, the vocalized manuscripts? Do we see the reading of those seven readers or the 10 readers? And you don't, you, you kind of don't. You see some of them, like a few of them you do. Uh, but oftentimes what you see is you see the, uh, you can see the regional tradition. And this will go to like, who are these seven or who are these 10? You can, you can look at a vocalized manuscript and say, okay, the reading of this manuscript is from this region. Like this is a Boston reading. This is a, you know, Iraqi reading. This is a Syrian reading. This is a Hejazi reading. But rarely in the, in, in the grand scheme of like the number of vocalized manuscripts, uh, uh, can you say, aha, this is Abu Amr. This is one of the seven canonical readings. And perhaps, so it depends on how you look at it. Well, you know, the, the tradition, the, I guess some, some traditional reports do say that they were the most popular in their regions, but most popular is relative. And we don't quite know when the manuscripts were vocalized. So maybe those manuscripts were vocalized before those readers were born or before they became popular. So there are all kinds of questions like this that we don't have the answer to. But TLDR, yes, more or less, yes. That's what they tend to say is that they, they, they generally, and I, I do think that is the case, those readers that were chosen were quite popular in their respective regions. And I think these readings, before we get to the readers, one more time, just make a comment and get your thoughts. Why seven? 
right? Here we go with this thing again. And I think there's a sacred significance to choosing seven, uh, which, you know, I can imagine he felt tugged in multiple directions at points. I don't know which one do I get? So but I, gotta I think, think I think, so I have a, uh, this is actually a, a chapter uh, uh, um, in the, in the book I'm writing uh, right now in my monograph is why did Ibn Mujahid choose these seven? So nobody really knows and we can't like interrogate right. him, but I think, I think I figured it out if I may be so bold to claim. So mm. I won't share it here. You, you know, you all have to wait for it, but I think yeah. I figured it out. And I think the number seven is a coincidence. And uh, here's the thing. People have criticized him for choosing seven. They're like, why didn't you make it six or eight? Because when you made it seven, you confused people. You made them think. So many people apparently, even today actually, confuse the seven ahruf that we talked about with the seven readers. They're like, oh, the seven ahruf. They're like, no, 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 no. They have nothing to do with each other. And oh, how we wish you just would have added one person or removed one person just so that you don't confuse people. So I, I actually think it was sheer coincidence he it was not intentional on his part uh as to why it ended up with seven you know if that if that makes sense yeah because being an <laughs> outsider right like i even was like oh this seems to have a connection to yeah, seven yeah. being Aruf. I, I think it's pure Aruf. on this part yeah okay mm -hmm. excellent i look forward to your book obviously and when we get that let me know i'll make sure i put that link in the description because we're gonna have to do a follow-up pertaining to the book as well I, I i would i hope so um Awesome. So what do we know about the lives of those readers and uh, what are they like? So I'm sure, you know, like anyone, you can go into early church history and you could find a really noble guy who who's got a real good thumbs up named Origin. And then what do you find out a couple hundred years later? He's a heretic. Whoa, what happened here? Like, you know, and, and then there's very interesting people. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit. Yeah, so the the seven readers and the ten, just e even more so. So they 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 um they've generally lived. Uh, the earliest ones they die in the uh, early uh, second century. So that would be early eighth century CE. Um, and the m later ones they die in the early third century. So they span. So that would be the eighth uh, ninth century. So they span that time. And some of them are students of each other. So that's another thing to, to know. So who are like the earliest ones? So the earliest ones we have uh, Ibn Ahmed. So he's 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 Damascene. He's from Damascus. He dies 118 uh, Hijri and AH. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in Mecca, we have Ibn Kathir, not to be confused with the famous exegete who wrote like a, a, a tafsir, not not him, uh, a different Ibn Kathir. He dies at 120. Uh, in Medina, we have Abu Jafar. He dies around 128 or 130. Uh, in uh, Iraq, so in Kufa, we have Asim, he dies 127, I think. And then we have Abu Amr, he's in Basra, he dies, I think, in 140 or 150, something like that. So those are them. Then they have students. So so uh, uh, Abu Jafar in Medina, one of his students is Nafa, uh, and, and he dies in like the 170, 179, or 171, I don't remember now. Uh, uh, and then we have in Kufa, we also have Hamza, 154, and we have two of his students who are in the canon. Uh, and then we have Yaqub who dies in the early third century in Basra. So those are those are kind of you know the readers, the landscape. So uh, we know different like different amounts of information about about the about about the the different readers. Some we know a lot more about, and some we don't. So for example, Ibn Ahmed, we generally don't know that much about him, uh, um, other than that essentially he was just a, he dedicated his life to reading the Quran. He was a Quranic reader. Um, the same with Abu Jafar, but we know a little bit more about his life. Uh, but as you get to the later ones, we know a little uh, more. For, so, for example, Kisa'i, he's he's in he's a Kufan, but he was also a famous grammarian, and he's uh, he uh, he got into a big argument uh, debate with uh, Sibawe, so that very well, like the father of of of, uh, of 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 Arabic grammar, if you will, um, and you know that argument between them led to the death of Sibawe, and uh, yeah, yeah, got, so so. I don't remember the details. It's been a while since I've read it. So take this with a grain of salt. But it, basically, they were debating a grammatical issue uh, as to whether about a wasp, as to whether it's specifically what is correct Arabic. Is it you know this way or is it that way? And it, apparently, as the story goes, what Kisseti did is he bribed a bunch of Bedouins uh, and he told them, listen, when I ask you, when we call on you guys and ask you, how is this said? You have to agree with me. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, he told him just like hang out outside a little bit because he knew he knew he knew that what Sibue would do is when they disagree, he'd be like, you know what, let's go ask a Bedouin. Let's go ask a real Arabian. 
and let's see what they have to say. And, and in fact, that's exactly what happened. During their debate, Sibo was like, you know what? Let's go find us some Bedouins and ask them and let's see who's right. And they went to the Bedouins and they were bribed by Kasai and they asked them and guess what? And so, so then Siboy apparently was like distraught and he kind of wandered out. He refused to eat for days and he died or something like that. I don't know. Right. So who knows? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it's entertaining. No, no, no. <laughs> it is. And yeah. so, and, and Kasai is a very interesting personality. So he has other stories like this that are transmitted from him about like of him, you know, making like uh, elementary mistakes in prayer with like Harun al-Rashid, the caliph praying behind him, uh, or like, you know, someone asked him like, hey, why do you read this way? But instead of giving him like an, an actual answer, he just answers with a pun. And so one example of that is, you know, he was asked, you know, there's a word for for wolf, it's vib, and he reads it vib without a hemza, but there's hems can mean a letter. It's like a glottal stop, but it can also mean like a, a spear, like a pokey thing. And so he asked, he was asked, why don't you hemzate? Why don't you, you know, do hemza of the word wolf? And he says, I'm afraid, you know, the wolf will eat me. So he's like, basically, he interpreted, like, why, why, why don't you poke? Why, aren't, why don't you poke the wolf? And he's saying, like, I'm afraid the wolf. Well, that's funny, but you didn't answer the question. <laughs> so he, he, he was a very lively person. And um, so, you know, that's those are basically the readers. Uh, um, I don't know. I can give you more details about the other ones. You know, there are some stories about Hamza, who is a famous Kufan reader. Um, he was controversial with his reading. Some people didn't like it that much. Generally speaking, later on, it was it was it was pretty uh, unanimously accepted. Uh, and yeah, so so those were the uh, those were the readers. And uh, I guess I will say something informative, right? So one thing that 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 uh, unifies or unites the readers is their adherence to the Uthmanic text. So in their lifetimes, there were readers that did not uh, follow the Uthmanic text 100%. Uh, but all 10 of these readers, with minor, minor uh, uh, exceptions, they all more or less followed the Uthmanic text. And as I mentioned before, that was kind of one of the stipulations that the Muslim community adopted for the uh, canonicity of the readings. Um, in this vein, before we get to next question, um, analogies, right? I have to give early Christianity was kind of the wild, wild West. Like, in fact, I asked Dr. Bart Ehrman, you know, like, Hey, Dr. Ehrman, um, you have Roman Catholics and like the furthest from that are like snake handling Pentecostals, right? Who think that God, it mo they have a modalist view. God is one, but shows up in different personalities, but it's not the Trinity. They think it's one God that shows up in, in different personalities, whereas Trinity has three in one, and somehow that's supposed to make sense. But anyway, uh, the point is, it's 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 very there's a mystery to the Trinity. Of course, if you ask a Christian, if you ask someone like me, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. The point is, is there was really big differences. In fact, he says there were more differences in early Christianity, and they were called Christians, followers of Jesus, at least. Uh, into the early second century where some had multiple gods and they still were considered Christians. And some were like only one God and Jesus was a man and the father of him was Yahweh. So like technically there were still Christians, but they didn't worship Jesus or they didn't, you know, whatever it might be. They might have seen him and venerated him, but still had like a, a monotheistic Judaism type of view. So anyway, I just say all that to say like these readers that you're saying that didn't really follow Uthmanic, this is a bad analogy, but my point is, was it potentially the wild, wild west of reading traditions and potentially having like uh, variations of reading traditions other than Uthmanic ones mm -hmm. around this time? And these guys are, are kind of the heroes when, when later Uthmanic approaches like, yeah, stamp of approval, kind of like Origin was a universalist. Later church people said, look, the, we still reserved his writings, but he was a heretic and they now don't consider him a saint uh, or they, they downplay mm -hmm. him. Is it possible that there were other things like that going on, but because Uthmanic approach became the solidified, like here is the one that that's what we're seeing. I don't know if that's the best, the best way to No, That's a very good question. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you know, if you look at the, the, the palimpsest, right? So I mentioned that the, the, the level of difference between the text of the palimpsest and the Uthmanic text is very minor, right? right? In the grand scheme of things. And I am personally not aware of anything that like shows or presents a 
different theology, you know, than, than Islam, like, oh, God is not one, Muhammad is not a prophet, you know, like, like, like there's nothing that consequential, if that makes right. sense. So, you know, don't enter a house before you ask permission or before, you, I mean, like little, little things like that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, they're inconsequential uh, to, you know, big theological questions. Of course, I don't want to dismiss like a lot of scholarly work, including myself. It's all about the details, right? So like I, uh, <laughs> I, I care a lot about the details and like, oh, wow, you know, sometimes a single letter can be very interesting. But again, it's, it's always helpful to step back and look at things from a big picture. And um, the differences are incons are more or less, I don't know. I, would, I mean, I don't know of anything that, that has a significant theological implication to it uh, of, of, right. that, uh, of that magnitude. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's a great point. And, and I want people who are watching this, mm -hmm. especially if you're a Christian, to take note. I mean, it is what it is. Facts are facts. And this is what seems to be the case. It seems they had a standard understanding, a standard theological doctrine. Well, not so. Here's a different. Here's the thing. Understanding okay. is different from reading. So there's one thing to read a text, but there's another thing to understand it. So the theological right. interpretation of yes. that is different. So there were in early Islam, there were di there were definitely uh, uh, different. Uh, um, there were definitely differences in theology, and even till today, you know, the, the Shiite uh, Islam has slightly different theology than Sunni Islam, etc. Mm -hmm. And even Ash'ari within Sunnism, like Ash'aris and Etharis, they they you know understand God and His attributes differently. I'm not trying to to deny the existence of theological differences, lest people say, well, you've marginalized what I consider to be a huge difference, but that's different from the text itself. Right. That's the point I'm trying to make. So we also had like historically, have, we had the Mu'tazidis, we had all kinds of things like that. But the key thing that I'm trying to point out is the text itself, there's nothing in the Quran itself that is, uh, 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 that has cha that has changed or, or is present in a companion codex and not the other one that has these large theological ramifications. People, these different sects look at the same text and Got understand it. it differently and say that, no, this text says X and someone else says, no, this says Y. So I want to make that point clear. This is, oh man, this is an amazing interview, by the way. I'm absolutely loving this. I'm learning a lot. Uh, this makes me think too, like if we think the reading traditions, just throwing it out there as someone, you could tell I'm like a student asking a teacher. Um, in the reading traditions, if there were other ones that weren't Uthmanic, it's not like they're reading off of a text that's so different. If it is something like the palimpsest, let's say, let's say there are like uh, primitive, just rearranging order, and that's oftentimes what it is. It's not even like the text is so different. There might be a word or two, but the point is, it's the same thing. Um, so my question gets down to a root kind of in saying, even if they weren't Uthmanic readers, they were still, in a sense, reading similar. Uh, stuff, even if there were palimpsest and potentially mm -hmm. other fragmentary uh, documentation or other Quran that, that's just ordering things a little different, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's the interpretation that you'll see that varies. It's not the text, ultimately. Not saying there isn't differences, but it's like pretty much we've got it. Like We, we would give it a 99.9 .9 on, a, on a test of saying this is really good, actually, uh, especially for that old. And so this is the argument, actually, that uh, Behnam Sadegi and Mohsen Gudarzi had, uh, put forward is, is they say, you know, they, they say, well, if we look at the palimpsest, which is, has been radiocarbon dated, and so we, we have a very good idea, it's from like the early, it's from the, the first half of the seventh century, right? So it quite likely was, was written prior to or contemporary to the Uthmanic codification, but it's a different text tradition. But because these two things are so similar, mm. the differences between, it, it is... It is highly unlikely that what we're looking at is our differences due to oral transmission, right? So this isn't me like sitting down with my circle of students and just like sharing a story with them. And then they go off and later on, like they write it down or maybe they they share it with someone else or something like that, right? Uh, and then, you know, at, a, at the level of just like, here's the here's a gist of the story that I told. Uh, and so he, you know, what he argues is that there was a, but but it's also not the same as the Uthmanic tradition, which we've talked about, mm -hmm. uh, um, and which is like it very clearly copied in writing because it's so uniform. It's somewhere in the middle. So he says, well, it was a com it was a hybrid. Maybe some dictation took place, something like that. But it's it's a it's it's written oral transmission that was taking place. Um, and and he says, well, clearly the, the Uthmanic text and the palimpsest share a common ancestor because of those similarities. And he posits that this common ancestor is the prophetic archetype. So he says the commonality between them goes back to the prophet. So that's their argument. 
I generally find that compelling, but there are still like, again, the devil's in the details. There are, are still question marks around certain aspects and like, was all of it, was this, was that. But the general idea is that the, the text traditions, the two different text types are so close and so early and, and, and attested so early in time that really, at least we can say, if you don't want to say it's a prophetic archetype, one could say that the archetype goes back to the time of the prophet, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, like obviously, you couldn't prove it empirically, but it is heading, it's leaning optimistically in that direction. And I think that I have no problem with it. That's why I say, like, I'm not saying, like, oh, I think this goes back to the prophet. Like, I know. I say it like, it wouldn't, it doesn't hurt. It, like, I don't get why people are trying to fight this as if this isn't something that could be the case. And that's what makes me think that uh, the, the tradition, if I may ask, because I said this to Dr. Nasser on a, on a recording, like there's a tradition that the prophet never wanted, never had the Quran, like compile the Quran, but that seems to be a later tradition maybe. So the question is, if the Quran does go back to the life, let's say within the life or the latter life of Muhammad, um, is it possible that, that that tradition is just not a not a true tra tradition that Muhammad himself did not have this? Because from what I understand, there's many traditions. Sometimes the traditions contradict each other. That that's not the Quran and that's not the Sunnah, whatnot, you know, the life of the Prophet and stuff. These are traditions that even oftentimes a lot of Muslims would say that's late. We don't even agree that that could be embellished or myth or whatever. And that's something I can appreciate. I really do value that. So the question is that idea that that the prophet himself didn't want to compile the Quran. Isn't that a later idea or is that early? Uh, so I would, I would remove agency from didn't want to and, and leave it at did not, if that makes sense. Right. So according, at least according to m most traditions, the prophet did not compile the Quran in a codex. It doesn't mean okay. he didn't have it written down. So I mentioned before, like earlier on, I mentioned this figure by the name of Zayd ibn Thabit and he did have scribes. So he had people who sat down and he, it, it seems like it is historical that he had scribes. So I just want to point that out. Right. So that, 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 uh, uh, you know, whether he would dictate Quran or whatever, and they would write things down, but he did have scribes. So, uh, uh, some chronic material was written, was all of it written down? Some of it, most of it. I mean, we could go on about this all day. Yeah. Uh, my, 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 my take on it is who knows? Like I, I, I have no idea. I think what's interesting, this is what I find very interesting. When I look at a codex, even the earliest manuscripts, whether it's the Palimpsest or Uthmanic one or any of that kind of thing, it does not strike me that this is the first attempt. This is a people's first attempt at producing a book. Right. Uh, uh, that is my take. I mean, knowing, you know, just the little bit I know about the history of writing in Arabic and the uh, uh, and all that kind of stuff, I find it hard to believe that the culture that produced these codices had never had not have a had have, had never had a codex among them, if right. that makes sense. So I think it speaks to the fact that, and we we know this now because we have thousands and th I mean I don't even know on like many many inscriptions uh, all throughout Arabia that are in Arabic, right? So so that that the Arabic language they're in different scripts, but they are in Arabic, and what that shows is that there was there was writing taking place in Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's an interesting area that is still very much under explored and underappreciated, but that's just how I, how I look. And I think that's a much more interesting question potentially is like, what was the written culture like prior to Islam? Like we, we have a very little idea uh, of what that looks like, but maybe, maybe there's a, Maybe there's a, 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 a Dead Sea Scrolls out there that we can discover one day that, you know, <laughs> we'll yeah. tell us more about that. Yeah. A Dead Sea Scroll type of Islamic thing. And yeah, this, you're, you have a really good point. And I think that that leans in the direction of saying there's definitely something prior. I mean, you talked about common ancestor to the Palimpsest and the Uthmanic uh, text. So it, it seems like something might have been already developed in the works before that. It's the same problem I run into to people who are too skeptical uh, in my biblical stuff, right? I have a guy yesterday wanting to dispute with me that Paul never existed. And I'm like, so why do you say that? And his first reasoning was, well, the earliest manuscript we have of Paul dates 170 years or something after the life of Paul, right? Okay. And he goes, and only one mention in first Clement. So he starts to do these like hypercritical analyses of like, what is the empirical data we have? And that restricts us. And then he had this kind of conspiracy that Paul was invented 
<laughs> to backdrop like all of this it's more ad hoc than it is just what does occam's razor tell us yeah. and and this seems to be the most clear thing is that i have a hard time believing that muhammad himself was not actively in some sense extremely uh, impacted by the judeo-christian background that's just my opinion right like mm -hmm. i think i think well he comes out of the abrahamic it's very clear like this is not a new thing even muslims understand that and for me i think he saw this and he had such an impact i have a hard time believing they didn't put pen to paper i have a very or pen to papyri or mm -hmm. or you know something <laughs> you know what i mean it's just um it's tough for me to believe so sorry for getting excited and just telling you that i i love this stuff i wish people would stop um stop making polemics and in arguing like over silly stuff if you don't know and we can't prove it at the end of the day to say look this is what i think uh, but but I wouldn't make a mountain out of a molehill, like antagonistically trying to jab at Muslims for this because the scholarship is pretty on board. Even like Sean Anthony, right, who's openly said like you know he's he's not a Muslim, but he's like, sorry guys, this is good evidence that goes right back very close, you know, to the prophet. So, and I just wanted to add one comment. You know, there are. It doesn't mean we have all the answers, right? So there are. Uh, very interesting question to do with source criticism, right? So, um, you know, for example, where can we find mentions of certain uh, uh, stories or pericopes in the Quran and things like that? Where can we place it? How do they diffuse? I mean, there are all kinds of very interesting questions like that uh, that we can talk about. And also like in terms of the composition of these narratives and, and things like that, that is still ongoing and very early actually, like in, in Quranic studies uh, and whether or not we can date the actual text of the Quran as a whole to a specific time period, uh, which we just talked about, it has very little bearing on on questions of of of, uh, of source criticism, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I love source criticism, as you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to answer those. Um, so I've got a couple more, if you're okay with it, and uh, ready to take a jab? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the companion of the prophet, Ibn Masud, am I saying that, Masud? Mm -hmm. uh, is said to have been opposed to the standard text of Uthman, and continue to teach his own reading with his own copy in Kufa. Is there any truth to these reports? And I guess if there was any truth, like you'd have to ask, like what kind of text would he have had? Like a palimpsest? Would it be minor detail differences? You know, like what we see in just the order? Hard, to, hard to know. But what are your thoughts? Yeah. So this is a very interesting question. So uh, just to make a point something out, which I didn't before, the palimpsest is not the Ibn Mas'ud Codex, right? It's a codex of like an unknown companion as Sadiqi would have would phrase it. But uh, did Ibn Mas'ud oppose the Uthmanic codification or did he have his own tradition and cling to it? That that seems, there, there you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, evidence that seems to point towards, yes, that is the case. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, a couple examples. So, so for example, there are uh, people writing in, let's say, the the late second century, early third century, like grammarians. Like there's a guy by the name of Farla. He was a Kisai student. He was a student of a Kisai who we talked about, and in his work. So, so we don't have any companion codex that has survived, okay? Uh, but we do have literary reports. But I don't consider it the same as like here's a hadith, here's this, and I'll tell you why. Because Al Farla, he is an eyewitness to these codices. He says, I saw, like, right, like I saw in the codices of Ibn Mas'ud, and he will say X, Y, Z. He'll say, like, I saw this. He even mentions, like, there's a very interesting thing where he mentions, he says that I saw the codex of a guy by the name of Al-Harith Ibn Suwaid, who was a student of Ibn Mas'ud. He said, I saw this verse written like this. Like, it was a variant. He was pointing it out. And he says, it was like a transposition, and he says that his codex was buried during the reign of Al-Hajjaj. So someone had dug this thing up, right? So like a hundred years later and started looking through it, which I find like, so I wish he gave us more, but that's all he says. He's like, this man, this Mus'haf was buried, you know, during the reign of Hajjad because he apparently cracked down on the Ibn Mas'ud tradition in Kufa. And he's looking through these, these manuscripts, these old codices, which is very interesting. So here we have someone who is an eyewitness who is documenting it in his book. So to me, that's, that is contemporary evidence of the existence of codices that belong to a tradition ascribed to Ibn Mas'ud that is not the Uthmanic tradition. Mm -hmm. And then we have, and then the, what's very interesting as well is he mentions things about orthography, like, oh, 
in the codices of Ibn Mas'ud, there are certain words that are spelled like this. And what's really cool is like he couldn't have made this up because this is not part of the Hijazi spelling tradition, which we find part of the Uthmanic text. And it's sort of a uh, uh, more in line with the old Nabataean Arabic spelling tradition. So it's not like, so it speaks to the his, it speaks to the historicity and accuracy of these reports. So we, ha we have we have sort of eyewitness accounts uh, of these things, but we don't have any unfortunately surviving codices yet of these traditions. Right. We can see remnants of these things in some manuscripts, and I think that's an interesting subject. But uh, we don't have like a whole codex of Ibn Mas'ud. Now to go back to your question, was that actually the case? It does seem to be the case that Ibn Mas'ud strongly opposed the Uthmanic codification. For a variety of reasons, you know, it might be a, some ego. He felt that he was left out of the project and he was more deserving of, of being the person in charge and things like that. And he had this very interesting thing. He told people like, you know, like, like conceal your, your, your codices. Maybe that's why people buried them or, or hid them. But like, you know, and then he quotes the Quran. He quotes a verse. He says, uh, uh, whoever clings to something, uh, Will will rise on the day of judgment with that which they concealed or which that which, which they held, and so he really uh, it, it really does seem that you know the Ibn Mas'ud tradition uh, it 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 kind of was the last bastion uh, in Kufa of of non Uthmanic uh, traditions until it kind of slowly you know died out. That doesn't mean there were not uh, now. Of course, there's some people who say, well, this this never existed, and this goes back to the Sabbat Ahrof. I forgot to mention this earlier. <laughs> One interpretation of the Sabbat Ahrof is that. All these reports of companion codices and things like that, they're all wrong. Like they, they're all false. They're all fabrications. And all the seven Ahruf go back to the one Uthmanic text. So that is an, an opinion out there, which I think I, I'm very comfortable saying that doesn't seem to be a reflection of reality. And they say, look, all these other companion readings are just exegesis. They're not actual uh, codices. But then what do you do when someone says, like, I saw with my own eyes, like, in this book, this written? Yeah. And then we have the palimpsest, which which attests a different textual tradition. So, uh, um, yeah, that, that does seem to be, like, the wrong opinion. Uh, but so, so to come back, so Ibn Mas'ud seems to have definitely had uh, uh, stuck to his tradition. And, okay, so things can get kind of complicated. Why? Because some people point to the legacy of Ibn Mas'ud. So even though his tradition died out, it doesn't mean his, like, uh, uh, it doesn't mean his genes died out. So right. if you think of it in terms of like genetics and DNA, his, like the, the, the Kufan readers, uh, um, there, if you look at their readings and you compare the different, the variants in their, the canonical ones, even compared to the readings of other non-Kufans, you can see you can see the traces of Ibn Mas, even though it's been harmonized with the Rasm, with the Uthmanic text, yeah. so that it doesn't really deviate. You see traces of the Uthmanic reading left over, wherever it, it sort of. So you mean the, it, uh, not Uthmanic, but the. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Ibn Mas'ud tradition. I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, you see remnants of the Ibn Mas'ud. So, so his lineage lives on. Now, some people will say, well, for example, someone like Hamza, you know, they will say, because part of his lineage goes back to Ibn Mas'ud, that is evidence that Ibn Mas'ud eventually decided to uh, uh, abandon his text and adopt the Uthmanic text. And I think they have it backwards. I think it's, 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 it's that the Ibn Mas'ud tradition was harmonized with the Uthmanic tradition, as opposed to Hamza is a reflection of what Ibn Mas'ud eventually adopted, if that makes sense. Right. And I have a lot, like, there's a very, there, are, there are very good reasons why, and this is part of a discussion in my book, uh, uh, but we'll have to, we'll have to save that for a different time, but I hope that gives you a window into like one very interesting question is how did these reading traditions form, right? If you think about it, you know, there were other traditions that were non uthmanic that were around and how did they, how did they get harmonized with the uthmanic text? How did they gel? How did they crystallize? So another, so Ibn Mas'ud isn't the only person who had another tradition. There were many other ones. Uh, but he was perhaps the most famous. There's another companion by the name of Ubay ibn Kab. He had also his own tradition. How does how does that stuff work its way into the Uthmanic text? I think that's very interesting. And we have reports of other companions also opposing or not liking uh, the... So this goes into like what's politics and what's theology, right? right. So, so there's a theological point, which is that this concept of ijma or like consensus that because the Muslim community has arrived at a consensus of the supremacy or authority of the Uthmanic text, that can be used to make 
certain historical claims, which I, I, I don't agree with. So, for example, there's a report uh, uh, about one of the students of Ibn Mas'ud, his name is Al-Qama, like they travel to, to, to Syria and they run into Abu Darda, who's another companion. And Abu Darda, he says, hey, I guess, I guess he heard about a group of people coming over from Kufa and he's like, anyone amongst you from the students of Ibn Mas'ud? And Al-Qama, uh, he's, he's, like, he's like me. And he says, hey, how do you read this chapter? It's Walayli Ida Yaksha. He's like, how do you read this? So the guy recites and he says, wal Untha, which is different than what's in the Uthmanic text, which is Wama Khalaq al wal Untha. And he's like, aha, this is how I learned it from the Prophet. The exact same way. And then he says, but which one is it that he said he learned from the Prophet? Right. Ibn Mas'ud. So he agrees with Ibn Mas'ud, right? Okay. So he says, he says, aha, you have confirmed what I know, which is the this reading, not the Uthmanic reading. Right. As for those people, Ha'ula, they want me to read Wama Khalaq al-Dhakara wal Untha. They want me to read according to what's in the Uthmanic text. Wallahi la utabi'ahum. By God, I will never follow them. So oh, he, wow. like, he categorically is opposed to following that reading, right? So now the question is, now that really, like, how historical is this narrative? Right. So, um, one could, depending on like how skeptical you are, one could say that this narrative was constructed by the pro-Ibn Mas'ud uh, 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 people in order to show other companions affirming his reading. So it's like a validation or an affirmation of his reading. And so, I mean, and then you can you can kind of, this rabbit hole can go on thing, but whether or not you accept it that way, we have reports of other companions uh, either opposing readings in the Uthmanic text or even like younger companions like uh, uh, Ibn Abbas uh, actually, you know, instructing his students to not read certain Uthmanic readings and to read this instead. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the uh, and, I, and I think the salient point is that these different uh, uh, schools kind of die out over time. Right. And what really remains uh, uh, is the Uthmanic uh, tradition. So rather than it being radically different, like the early church in their thinking of different cult groups, it seems more of an infighting in a political power struggle, it seems. And I'm, I mean, like this probably is entering – there's so many minds in this bomb field, you know, of trying to like enter in and figure out what's going on. But it's not as radical as what we see obviously in the early church, uh, but it there still seems to be there's this tension and and this tension is something I would love to explore further with you at some point. Uh, maybe just like exploring little interesting rabbit holes of like what this person did and what the, maybe what the arguments are or surrounding it. Cause you may not even have an opinion. You may just, you may be like me where someone goes, did Jesus exist? And I think there was a guy, but then someone goes, well, who was he? And I go, are you ready for this? Uh, so let me give you 10 theories of like yeah. really interesting ones about who the guy may or may not have been. Um, and if you would take me on that journey one day, I'm sure you know quite a bit about it. Just the different things like taking that critical approach. You really got my mind working because now I'm like, all right. Yeah, there's people who will say, for example, just to give you an example, uh, this, the the the. Uh, there's a Valentinius, right? He's a he's from Alexandria, Egypt, who was a Gnostic. We call him a Gnostic or someone like that, who said that he learned his teachings from someone who was taught directly from Paul. But the church at large that won out says, no, we have someone who learned directly from St. Peter. Mm -hmm. Is this a competitive political move to say my movement came earlier and this is true? Or is it all legend to try and bolster the claims of the person? I love this stuff. Nobody knows for sure, but it's a fun exercise. So, Yeah, absolutely. And you do have, you know, one very interesting thing, tidbit is I mentioned Ubay ibn Kab. You know, he was also like a, a big famous reader. And apparently he got into hot water with Omar, you know, the second caliph, because he would recite Quran and he would lead prayers in, in like the Prophet's mosque in Medina and things like that, that uh, uh, allegedly Omar would consider to be abrogated. He's like, why are you reading this stuff, man? We don't, he's like, essentially the essence of his response is, who are you to tell me what I can and can't read when I learned it directly from the Prophet? So, yeah. but who knows? I mean, I, my, my t I guess my take on these things is, short of doing sort of the, 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 my due diligence and really digging into it and doing a lot of, a lot of work on, on analyzing and studying these reports and dating them and all kinds of things like that. Um, I use them to, because of the value that they give us in terms of 
how we can understand the how early Muslims received the Quranic text. How did they receive it? These things like and and people who revere Ibn Mas'ud or people who revere Ubay, whether or not it's a real story, it's a historical narrative. It tells us something about how they perceived that figure that they revered. Right. Right. And that I think in and of itself is a window into the formation of the text, the tr the transmission of the text, and also the early Muslim understanding of the text. And that's where I see a lot of value. So when I say when I share some of these stories, sometimes it's not that I take it as historical or not historical. I take it as in every single one of these narratives right. gives us insight into early Muslim thought and the different factions and the different groups. And there are reports that I will tell you, I think this is categorically not historical, but right. why would someone like, what does it say about someone who would invent a story about the prophet doing X, Y, Z with the Quran or saying this or doing that? And what can we learn? And right. that's what I think is very interesting. Yeah. The, it's an interesting thing you're describing there because Oftentimes, that also can work as historical evidence for the existence of people. Why are they venerated? I mean, like, we're going to make up a fictional person that they're venerated. This gets into a root of like, did Muhammad exist? Like, I see no reason why, personally, this this is is still disputed. But there are people out there, you know, that, that still want to act like he didn't exist or something. And it's like. I don't know. It just seems really strange to legendize a non-existent figure and to have this going on. But I mean, it's, it's a lot less ad hoc to just go with this guy existed. And I say that to say there are people who do that with like the characters around Jesus, uh, Paul, Peter, and you start to see like, why are they still using this character, this person? There seems to be some veneration of a real person there. And what you said about uh, Omar, who said, no, 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 we don't read it. We read it like this. Or what are you talking about? Well, I learned this directly from the prophet. Who are you to tell me? To me, I even think like I like to use historical exercise to think, is this anachronistic? Like, could this be Omar trying to say, no, like we're, we're pointing toward Uthmanic text here, which is after <laughs> Omar's already here. Like, is some of this stuff kind of hinting at hey, we already have a standardized text. We're already going with Uthman and you're already reading something that's outdated or something. I don't know. You know, it's just interesting questions. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful interview. I'm ha I've had a blast. My brain has exercised quite a bit here. I can't imagine what we didn't get into because it, it, it just piques my curiosity to want to learn more. Uh, they did a really good job of documenting a lot of stuff. So there's a lot to probe into. And I've said it before, this I know I, I I would love to see it could be a Netflix like series. Um, I would love the history of Islam from you know prior to the birth of Muhammad all the way to like all right here he he has died and the followers after the caliphs the whole nine like I would ugh. and and the influence and impact of his his wife and like or his wife's but more than one they still had impacts after his death and just the wars you know the, the what is it the red camel uh the red camel battle like there's just so much to, to to get into and i love it so thank you for scratching my itch and uh allowing me to interview you i hope everybody goes and checks out the website one more time what is the website and what can people gain from it Yes. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, and thanks for this, this uh, very interesting discussion. So um, I definitely encourage people to check out ixoweb.org. So it's iqsaweb.org. Uh, and what we've just done is we've launched a new platform. Uh, uh, and what we're offering is we're basically offering uh, an opportunity to folks in the general public who are interested in the Quran, who are interested in chronic studies, and who are interested in learning more about cutting edge scholarship of basically getting content directly from our members. And our members represent the leading scholars in chronic studies across the world. So we plan on offering uh, uh, everything from uh, webinars to some of our conference recordings. So sometimes it's difficult and expensive for just you know folks to travel and attend these conferences. But when we have the opportunity, we record and we publish on our website. So you can go check it out. We have recordings up there from our past conferences. Uh, we have master classes. So are you really interested in chronic manuscripts? And do you want to learn the basics? So we, ha we have a master class on that coming up. Are you interested in other aspects of the Quran? Uh, we plan on offering all kinds of things. And the last thing, or the, one of the, the other things that we do have is 
uh, a blog where we have contributions from all of our members, again, across uh, across the, the, the spectrum, across the world, uh, who contribute high quality blog posts, highlighting their research and answering some of the cutting edge questions and most important questions going on in chronic studies today. So if that's something that you are interested in, uh, definitely go check it out at ipsaweb.org. I have to. Uh, in fact, when I decided to get into Islamic studies recently, this would have been like the website I jump on immediately, which is still, I'm still early on. So I'm going to definitely be joining. I want to learn more, uh, learn from the scholars, understand what I'm talking about. And I hope you do too. So go sign up, check it out, see what the prices are. All you got to do is go check out the website. And I'm sure there are many options for different things that you're interested in doing. And um, in the long run, uh, if I may say this, is you're not only helping the scholars that are doing this work, you're also creating unity between the East and West. And the, the interfaith dialogue and the continuation of appreciating each other's traditions and respecting each other, this is this goes deeper than just I'm learning something. So helping participate is doing a really humanitarian thing. And at the end of the day, you're helping more than you realize by doing that. So Dr. Sidke, I hope that we can do this again, especially when your book is launched so that we can actually take a dive into the, some of the things you say and get you some controversy. <laughs> but uh, seriously, this has been amazing. I, I appreciate you. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you are looking for the one Aruf of Myth Vision, let me give it to you. We are Myth Vision. Myth Vision.